gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. The climate of every country in Western Europe is mild because of the Atlantic Ocean. This is partly due to strong currents in the Atlantic, which carry warm water from the Caribbean to Europe's coastlines. Also, prevailing westerly winds traveling over the Atlantic carry wet weather to regularly irrigate the land. The mild temperatures and moisture promote fertile growth. This in turn provides a variety of habitats for an astonishing range of species. We're about to begin a journey to explore this wonderful wildlife. The journey starts in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Azores. It will end in Iceland. It's a journey from the warm south to the colder north. We'll visit Portugal and see extraordinary birds, Spain and the world's rarest cat. We'll travel through France, the Channel Islands, the southwest coastline of England, Western Ireland, We'll head north to the mainland and islands of Scotland and the Faroe Islands. It's a journey of Atlantic-facing land and its wildlife. The Azores lie in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean some 900 miles west of mainland Europe. The archipelago of nine islands belongs to Portugal. The islands were pushed up from the sea by volcanic eruptions. They're amongst the youngest islands in the world. And they're in effect the peaks of a huge underwater mountain range known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This ridge divides the entire length of the Atlantic Ocean from south to north, and it marks the meeting point of the European and American continental plates. It passes through Iceland, which explains why Iceland is also volcanic. The Azorean islands have been relatively dormant in recent times. But the remains of past volcanic craters are clear on the land. Pico, the second largest island in the Azores, was the last island to rise from the sea about 250,000 years ago. Pico is also the name of the island's volcano. It stands 2,300 meters above sea level and it's the highest peak in the Azores. In fact, it's the highest peak in all of Portugal. Pico has been dormant for around 300 years, but evidence of volcanic activity remains. Hot vents still exist on the rocky slopes. The sea surrounding Pico and the other Azorean islands is warmed by a strong current that crosses the Atlantic from North America. The current originates in the Gulf of Mexico and is commonly known as the Gulf Stream, 
and the warmth it brings fuels life in the seas around the Azores. These are sperm whales. They're usually found in deep offshore waters. But in the Azores, the continental shelf surrounding the islands is very narrow and drops quickly to large depths. This deep water draws sperm whales much closer to shore, particularly near Pico Island. These are two females and a calf. Females and juveniles live separately from mature males. This group has been joined by a bottlenosed dolphin. It's an unusual animal. It's clearly malformed and has a bent spine. The most probable cause of this malformation is congenital scoliosis. It's likely that he's always had a curved back and that his spine didn't develop properly before he was born. It's not uncommon to see a dolphin with whales. Whether this dolphin is living with these sperm whales because of its malformation is anyone's guess. It's staying particularly close to the calf. It's as if he's playing with it. It follows the calf's every move. Sperm whales are found in all oceans and tend to visit the Azores seasonally. They're the deepest divers of all whales, holding their breath for up to 90 minutes. They can reach depths of four kilometers. Usually they only dive to around 600 meters where they feed mainly on squid. The dolphin, however, will have to stay near the surface. Several species of seabirds feed offshore in the ocean around the Azores. The islands are on many of the birds' migration routes. These are great shear waters. It's September, and they're on their way to breeding grounds in the South Atlantic. They're probably heading for the island of Tristan de Cunha, south of South Africa, after spending the northern summer off the coast of New England and eastern Canada. They're large birds that spend most of their time at sea and travel thousands of miles. They feed by diving underwater to catch fish. But they're taking a chance. The rich sea life here also attracts sharks. This is a short fin mako shark. It's a powerful animal and fast, capable of speeds of up to 60 kilometers an hour. Like its relative, the great white shark, it's dangerous and aggressive with a great turn of speed. It spends most of its time near the surface looking for food, which could be anything from squid to fish, porpoise to turtles, and birds. It may even take a blue shark another frequent visitor to the seas around the Azores. With its distinctive long pectoral fins, the blue shark swims effortlessly as it searches for fish to eat. It's being followed by black and white pilot fish, hoping for some scraps of food as and when the shark eats. Further offshore in the Azores, 
you'll find another impressive sea creature. These are mobula rays. They're related to the slightly larger manta ray. Mobulas can be up to five meters wide. There are at least half a dozen swimming together near watching divers. That gives you an impressive indication of their size. Mobulas use their large pectoral fins like wings to fly through water. The fins on each side of the head help funnel food to the mouth. Two remora fish have attached themselves to this one. They'll catch any food that passes the ray's mouth. The rays have congregated to feed on plankton and small fish, above one of the underwater peaks of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Although they're found in many different parts of the world, and regularly gather at this location in the Azores, very little is known about them. The largest island in the Azorean archipelago is Sao Miguel. It's known as the Green Island, as it's covered by thick, rich vegetation. On the eastern side of the island, you'll find the summit of Pico da Vara, a volcano which has been dormant for many centuries. As the island is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it rains frequently here even during summer. Clouds cover the mountain peaks much of the time. Part of the woodland cover on the slopes is laurel forest, which is a special and rare habitat found only in a few locations in the world where the climate is mild and rainfall is abundant. As the Azores have never been part of a large continent, any plant, bird or animal living on the islands have either been brought here in the past by wind or the sea, or more recently, by people. As a result, the native plants and animals on the Azores have evolved into unique species. Plants such as the Azorean holly and the Azorean bilberry. The Azorean chaffinch looks very different from the species you'll find on mainland Europe. It's darker and less colorful. Many of these special and rare species are under threat because non-native plants are destroying their natural habitat. Hydrangeas and yellow ginger lilies may well be pretty flowers. And the islands can look colorful when these plants from the Far East are in full bloom, but they're killing the native plants. Most of these flowers came from gardens planted by settlers on the islands during the past two centuries. Unfortunately, when they escaped from the gardens, they found conditions perfect for them, and they flourished. Alien conifer trees have also been planted, and these too have largely replaced natural laurel forest. This has had disastrous consequences for one of Europe's rarest birds, the Azorean bullfinch. It depends totally on the fruits of native plants to survive. At one time, only 200 pairs remained in the whole world. This is an adult. Both the male and female look identical with a black head. This is an immature bird born during the summer it's now September, and by November, it will have a black head, just like its parents.
Zao Miguel is the only place in the world where you'll see this bird. Conservation work is now being carried out to protect the Azorean bullfinch. The island's natural habitat is being re-established by destroying and clearing non-native plants. Once they're removed, the native forest recovers. And thanks to the conservation work, the bullfinch numbers have already increased. On the Atlantic coast of the Western Algarve in southwest Portugal, there's a site unique in Europe. These are the cliffs of Cabo Sadao. During early spring, they're particularly stunning. They're also the only place in the world where white storks nest on sea cliffs. It's a common bird that you usually associate with farmland, and you often see them nesting on poles, rooftops and chimneys in many parts of Europe. But here, they're nesting in their natural habitat. This is how they nested before man was on the planet. When a stork returns to a nest, it always performs a bill-tapping ritual before settling. They also do this to greet a returning partner. It's the month of March. There are eggs in the nests, but no chicks yet. The female lays up to four eggs, and both parents will take turns with the incubation, which lasts about a month. Some couples are still mating, and they do this to strengthen the bond between the male and the female. The same pair will generally return to the same nest every year and rebuild it. After many seasons, the nest gradually becomes huge. White storks migrate long distances. When a northern summer is over, these birds will migrate to sub-Saharan Africa. Further inland in southern Portugal, there's a vast area of open land in the region of Castro Verde. This is steppe land, a combination of arable farmland and grass pasture. During March, there's a fantastic display of wild flowers on the grassland. The flowers are thriving here because the climate is warm and the land is watered by rain, which falls regularly here through early spring. It's a life-giving climate that comes directly from the Atlantic. This rich grassland is a view that's rapidly disappearing in Europe. In most parts of the continent, modern farming methods have destroyed wild pastures. But this is a protected area. The land here is farmed in a more traditional, old-fashioned way. There are fewer farm animals. There's a variety of crops and wild pasture. And no pesticides are used. It's a perfect environment for wildlife. Uh -huh. 
This is a female Montague Harrier, similar to many other birds of prey. The male looks quite different to the female. It's pale gray, and it's also smaller. The male is putting on a courtship display to attract the female. It's a dance to prove that he's worthy of her. Montague Harriers are found in many parts of Europe, but there's another bird of prey at Castrovert that makes this stepland particularly special. It's one of Europe's rarest falcons, the Lesser Kestrel. Buildings have been built on the stepland to attract this stunning bird. Lesser kestrels are social nesters. They naturally nest in holes and crevices in rocks. And nesting holes have been created for them here. Several pairs will nest together in one building. The male is a particularly attractive bird with its sky blue head. They're migratory falcons and breed across southern Europe, the Mediterranean, the Middle East and Central Asia. They overwinter in Africa. A half century ago, there were thousands of lesser kestrels in Portugal. But around 10 years ago, the population had plummeted to around 150 birds because there wasn't enough food for them on the land. They eat mainly large insects, such as grasshoppers and locusts, that live on traditional wild pasture. But this type of land has largely been destroyed by modern farming methods. The conservation work carried out in Castro Verde has helped to reverse this process. It's increased the number of lesser kestrels in Portugal to around 400 pairs, a remarkable turnaround. The creation of rich pastures has given this magnificent and endangered falcon a vital lifeline. The stepland at Castro Verde is also home to another special bird, an astonishing bird, with an elaborate courtship display. It's a great bustard. In full display, a male will raise his rear and expose his bright white feathers. At the same time, he'll fan out the white feathers on his wings. When he performs his display, he can be seen for miles. And that's the whole point of the spectacle, to make him visible, and in particular, to attract females. It's also a way of keeping other males away from his patch of stepland. The strongest male with the most elaborate display will ultimately take the prize. The right to mate with the females. It's thought that they give the best display when the sun shines on a piece of land. And you can see why. The white feathers can act like a mirror reflecting sunlight. Great bustards are big birds, bigger than a turkey. In fact, they're the heaviest flying bird in the whole of Europe. In 
in addition to Portugal. Great bustards are found in Spain, other parts of southern and central Europe, and temperate Asia. You'll find them on large areas of open grassland that has plenty of room for their display and a good supply of food, particularly seeds and insects. This steppe land at Castro Verde is carefully managed to provide both. While the bird is declining in the rest of Portugal and across Europe, the numbers at Castro Verde have doubled since it's become a protected area. Around 80% of Portugal's entire population is now found here. It's an extraordinary bird on a special piece of land. This is very much a view of the past. Over 50 years ago, landscapes like this were common over all of Western Europe. A wonderful, rich pasture, and land that receives its moisture from the Atlantic Ocean. Around 50 kilometers southwest of Seville in southern Spain, you'll find Europe's largest wetland nature reserve. It's called Doñana National Park. The park covers an area of over 1,300 square kilometers, and it's full of wetland birds, water pools, and marshland. The wetlands have formed on an old river delta, which has largely been cut off from the sea by sand dunes. These sand dunes constantly shift and reform. They've even buried old buildings in some parts. In front of the dunes is an extensive beach facing the Atlantic. It extends for more than 30 kilometers. It's a protected beach, and access to it is controlled. It's considered to be one of the last unspoilt natural beaches in Spain. Because the number of people allowed here and their activities are limited, there's plenty of room for seabirds to land. These are sandwich terns. Behind the turns, a scavenging gull has found a fish to eat. Unlike gulls, turns don't feed on beaches. They generally catch and eat fish at sea. It's March, and it's likely they've landed here for a rest. They're probably heading to their nesting site in Northern Europe, having wintered off the shores of South Africa. The sand dunes and the trees growing behind the dunes are an important part of Doñana National Park. They provide protection from the sea and allow the marshland to retain water. Doñana's position in Spain places it at the boundary between the hot African continent to the south and the colder climate of Europe to the north. It's also between the warm waters of the Mediterranean and the cooler Atlantic Ocean. Its location is ideal for birds, especially migratory birds that travel between Africa and Europe during their spring and autumn migration. It's a filling station, a pit stop, where birds can feed before pushing on to their next destination. Many of the birds also breed here. 
The black-winged stilt is one of those. Its long legs and beak are perfect for wading and feeding in the wet pools. The glossy ibis is another species that will stay to breed at Doñana. This flock is feeding on a relatively dry part of the wetland. They're using their long curved beaks to probe for worms and insects. Many of the birds at Doñana have beautiful colors. This is a purple swamp hen. Like the glossy ibis, it's found worldwide in warm reed beds. And in Europe, it's found mostly here in southern Spain and some parts of Portugal. It's a chicken-sized bird with huge feet, which allow it to walk easily on the wet reeds. It's a much bigger bird than this passing moorhen. While the swamp hen is striking, the red-knobbed coot most definitely looks strange. During the breeding season, he grows what look like two red balls on the head. They're there to attract a mate. You'll only see this bird in Doñana and Morocco. It's a rare and unusual bird. Another bird that adds color to the wetlands is the purple heron. Like many other heron species, it will stand for a long time waiting for its prey. On the drier areas, it'll feed on anything that moves, a frog, a mouse, or a small bird. Over 400 species of birds have been recorded in Doñana, and there's clearly plenty of food for them here, and a great variety of feeding, especially in the long spring grass. The great white egret behind this squaco heron has found a good-sized snake. Being situated so far south in Europe, Doñana also has more exotic looking birds. Flamingos. Most of the flamingos are pink, but a few are black and white. These are young birds. Flamingos are born white, with a hint of black. The pink color comes from the food they eat. They live on shrimps, and the pink color is absorbed from the food into the feathers. The older the bird, the pinker it becomes. It's one way of determining the age of a flamingo. Doñana is among the world's best national parks. But there's one animal which makes it even more special. It's one of only two places in Spain, and indeed in the world, that you'll find the Iberian lynx, the world's rarest wildcat. The other stronghold for the lynx is east of Seville, in Andujar. It's a large area of national park in the Sierra Morena uplands. And the climate here is influenced more by the Mediterranean Sea than the Atlantic Ocean. The land sees little rainfall during the hot summer. 
but trees that have adapted to grow in an arid habitat cover the hills. There's a mixture of oak trees and stone pines. Like Donjana, this is a protected area and a crucial one. It's vital to the survival of the Iberian lynx. It's a magnificent animal, more than twice the size of a domestic cat. It has a short tail and pointed ears with characteristic tufts of hair. The Iberian lynx has been very close to extinction and remains one of the most endangered cat species in the world. Ten years ago, just a hundred of them remained. There are currently 300, and most of them are here in Andujar. The decline of the Iberian lynx began around 50 years ago, as its habitat was reduced all over Iberia to accommodate modern agriculture, land development, and road building. There was also another factor that contributed to its decline. Lynxes are reliant on rabbits for food. They account for 90% of its diet. During the past 50 years, the population of rabbits in Spain has been decimated at least twice by diseases such as myxomatosis. This had a devastating effect on the lynx population. It's now recovering thanks to this protected area in Andujar. But the lynx still leads a fragile existence. In an arid habitat, a river is the most important part of the landscape. It's where wildlife finds water. It's October in Andujar Natural Park, and the land is still dry after the long summer months. Female red deer have come to the banks of the Rio Yandula at dawn to drink. It's the beginning of the rutting season, and the males are calling from the hilltops. They're claiming territories and trying to attract females. For the moment, these females are happy to stay here in the cover of the valley bottoms. As the heat of the day intensifies, the river attracts thirsty birds. This is a young green woodpecker. It's not yet as colorful as the adult. The river is not only a supply of drinking water, it's also a source of food to many animals. The Rio Yandola is full of fish. There are many different species. These are barbo. Fish attract birds, like herons. This is a grey heron, the commonest heron species in Europe. Fish also attract otters. It's an ideal habitat for them. There's plenty of undergrowth on the riverbanks to build holts in which to rear their young. Otters breed in large numbers in Spain and are found throughout Europe. There's a small family here.
there are also reptiles in the river. A ladder snake is a common sight. It's looking for a mouse or a large insect that may be along the river edge. It's native to this part of southern Europe, and it gets its name from the ladder-like markings on its back. Andujar Natural Park is arguably the most important wildlife habitat in Spain. And it's vital for the survival of the Iberian lynx. Its rich wildlife is partly due to the strict protection that exists in the area. But above all, it's because of the life-giving nature of its rivers. These are the Cantabrian Mountains in northern Spain, a fabulous uplands in the Leon region. After Switzerland, Spain is Europe's most mountainous country. This area alone is a natural park of around 40,000 hectares, most of it around 2,000 meters above sea level. Much of the land is used as rough pasture for cattle. Because it's such a big area, it has a real wilderness atmosphere and has plenty of room for both farm and wild animals. A red deer stag at dawn is a particularly majestic view on a mountain setting. Red deer are common throughout Spain. We've already seen them in Andujar and they live in many different habitats. It's a very adaptable animal. Despite the relatively high altitude and cooler temperatures, the Cantabrian heathland is a rich habitat. The plants growing on the open landscape support a wide range of grasshoppers and butterflies. This species is a mountain clouded yellow. It's found only on the Cantabrian mountains and on the Alps. There are many small birds here too. This is a woodlark. It has a wonderful song. There are also vultures around. They're looking for dead ones of these. Or possibly one of these. Griffin vultures can be seen across the whole of Spain, but this may change. They're in danger. Finding food is becoming more difficult. There are now fewer carcasses available, as according to European law, dead farm animals have to be removed from the land. As a result, vulture numbers are decreasing. But in another part of the Spanish uplands, help is at hand. Some 50 miles north of Zaragoza are the foothills of the Pyrenees. And in the Sierra de Guara Natural Park, you'll see an incredible flock of vultures. Hundreds of them all in one place, waiting for food.
Manuel Aguilera has been feeding vultures here for over 20 years. He feeds them every day to help supplement the lack of food in the wild. In the past, vultures survived well in Spain on dead farm animals left on the land. In a way, their numbers were unnaturally high because of this. European law now bans the dumping of carcasses on the land. And feeding stations like this have become increasingly important for the vulture's survival. Manuel's feeding not only helps the vultures, it also allows us to get a close-up view of these magnificent birds. There are two bare patches on a griffin vulture's breast. This, in a way, acts like a storage bag. They eat as much as they can in one go, and this bag expands to accommodate the food. On the plains of Africa, they have to compete with lions, hyenas, and other scavengers. And they've evolved into efficient food grabbers, which can strip a carcass in a short period of time. The bag in a vulture's gullet helps it to do this. It will then fly away to digest the food somewhere else at its leisure. Griffins aren't the only vultures attracted to the feeding site. Bearded vultures also come here to feed. These vultures feed on bone marrow, and they can swallow big pieces of bone. If the bones are too big, they'll break them by dropping them from the sky onto rocks. But before they can do that, they'll have to wait till the griffins have finished with the flesh. Feeding vultures artificially might seem unnatural, controversial even, but this is the only way they'll continue to exist in their last stronghold in Europe. On the next part of the journey, we'll cross the Pyrenees to France. We'll travel along the French coast to Brittany. We'll explore the Channel Islands. Across the English Channel to the southwest of Britain. And we'll also uncover the stunning landscapes and wildlife of Ireland. <laughs> 